faith, or my newest creation, the Sterling Sword, solid silver swords, which also make great Father's Day gifts. In addition, we buy all... premium homes what's up everybody glad to see everyone starting to join the line decided to go a little early today because we're going to be doing the cheap bastard deal on the howie car show so stand by that's what the chatter is in the background so um <laughs> that's it it's like a tobias winslow leary production um so yeah we're going to be doing rapid fire right after the Howie Car show cheap bastard deal. So here we go. The Emperor of Hate. Oh, we go. All right. It's back. It's Howie Car, a cheap bastard deal. Oh, yeah. Sounds too good to be true. Oh, no, it's real, and it's a deal. You know there's plenty more when you shop at Howie's store for another Howie Car Cheap Master deal. Howie Car, the cheapest bastard around. Yesterday, Bruce from the Mets was missing me. Today, he's going, please, no more Brandon. <laughs> that may be the only one we got today. Okay. Cape Gunworks is New England's premier gun range. Cape Gunworks is not just a state-of-the-art gun range and firearms training center, nor are they just a shooter's pro shop. Their overarching goal is to treat you with the friendly respect you deserve. While supplies last, you can purchase one full year of range use at Cape Gunworks, valued at $500 for just $250. They're also waiving the $75 initiation fee, so you're getting a $575 value for just $250. Get your half-off membership right now by visiting HowieCarShow.com and clicking on store. These things always go very fast. People are really happy and they're excited to get them. They uh, they learn to uh, enjoy the uh, Cape Gunworks and improve their uh, marksmanship and uh, just uh, you know become more expert in self-defense. It's really a uh, it's really a good deal. Membership codes and instructions will be sent via email within 48 hours following your purchase. With us now to tell us more about what a membership Gunworks includes is Toby Leary from Cape Gunworks. Toby was filling in for me the last couple of days. Thank you very much, Toby. You did a great job. I appreciate it. Thank you, Howie. I had a ball doing it. It was a great time. We had some great calls and uh, talked about guns, politics, and religion. We completed the trifecta while we were on. <laughs> had a great All right. I, I like. I don't mind. Talk, I like to talk about politics. Sometimes guns. Religion, not so much. Right. I tend to stay away. But that's good. I'm glad you. I'm glad you worked it in. Anyway, listen. Tell us what uh, memberships you get with the uh, the cheap bastard deal. The membership uh, years membership to Cape Gun Works for just 250 bucks. Yeah, tell us what you got. It's an outstanding deal, Howie. Um, we have a lot of member only sales and events, and we just had our member only party last Friday night, and it was very well attended. People got to eat and shoot, and we had a giveaway and. Uh, all kinds of fun stuff like that. We do a couple times a year for members only. Plus, members get a discount of 5% off any product or accessory they buy. They get 10% off any courses that they take. And they get free, unlimited range use seven days a week during normal business hours. And members don't pay um, per visit for every time they come to the range. Not to mention, uh, this is the plus membership. So they can bring a guest free of charge. Um, they don't have to pay the guest fee. So that saves the money there as well. And uh, a new membership benefit for the plus members is they get free gun rentals. Um, and they also get a t-shirt 
and they get an option to rent the locker for rental. But one of the other things that uh, we have for members, Howie, that's a big deal is a 30 day satisfaction guarantee on all firearms purchases. So if you buy a gun and within 30 days, you found out it wasn't the one for you, bring it back. We'll give you your money back. You can pick something else. So uh, there's not too many gun stores that I know of that are doing that. Uh, so membership has its privileges. Yeah, and uh, you, you also get the free access to the indoor archery range. A lot of people like that as well. Yep, for, that's uh, true. You know, it's it's a different, a whole different experience <laughs> to uh, shoot arrows to, to become an archer. Correct. So yeah, so it's a uh, it's good. It's good. Uh, so again, this is a uh, this is a really great deal. This is the best uh, gun range in New England. It's conveniently located. It's uh, it's right at, right at the uh, Rotary there uh, in Hyannis. It's near the airport. It's near the Cape Cod Mall. It's uh, you know you don't have to you don't have to go around and about. And uh, you, you know the Cape uh, unfortunately is uh, is becoming uh, you know more less bucolic and more urban all the time. We talk, we've talked about all the uh, problems that they've had in, uh, in, in Hyannis. We, we love Hyannis. We love the bars. We love Main Street. But they are having problems. And, uh, you know, it, it, it pays to uh, be prepared. And one of the safest places in Hyannis is Cape Gunworks. <laughs> and it's always, <laughs> it's always 70 degrees on the indoor range. So no matter what the weather is doing outside, whether it's wind, sun, hail sleet rain which it could be any or all of the above it depending on what season we're in it's always beautiful and 70 degrees here 575 dollar value a year membership to the cape gun works the initiation fee is way 575 dollar value for just 250 how we show.com click on store right now there is so much to all right so that was the howie car show um Cheap bastard deal. So if you want it, give them a call. Uh, go to howiecarshow.com, click on store. I'll drop the link in the uh, in the uh, chat. But um, the bottom line is we I just wanted to bring you guys in on it and have some fun. So we did that. Um, now let's see, where's the store? Huh. Got to find a good website here. Son of a gun. Try this. This isn't on me guys. All right. There it is store. All right. Cool. And there it is. Now this is one of the, uh, fastest selling cheap bastard deals that they do so if anyone in the listening audience um, has an opinion or wants to i know you all have opinions if anyone wants to join you can click that link and click on the cheap bastard deal and you'll get a special special value all right. Um, I don't have a big agenda for today. We're going to be doing a lot of chat with the chat. We're going to take your calls. Um, so um, let's do it. We'll just go right into rapid fire a little bit early. And um, yeah, so I'm going to roll a quick opener so I can go grab a drink. I'll be right back. <laughs>
Welcome, everybody, to Rapid Fire, your weekly show, all things guns, freedom, Second Amendment, and self-defense. I'm your host, Toby Leary. Thank you for joining us. This show is sponsored by Vortex Optics and the USCCA, so please check out uh, the uscca.co forward slash rapid fire for a very special offer. Also, you can go to vortex.com, vortexoptics.com, and check out all the scopes and red dot sights and rifle sights and binoculars and accessories that they offer. We have some a huge selection of their product lineup in our shop, and we're glad to partner with them. They have unconditional lifetime warranty. That is second to none. So, um, so yeah, wherever you are in America, uh, you can check out their website or our website for great Vortex products or the uscca.co forward slash rapid fire. Um, and if you're not uh, a member yet, I would highly suggest you become a member. I'm not a big insurance guy, but the USCCA is so cheap, it's not even worth questioning for the legal and financial help that they can bring. So big news going on in gun world. Um, yesterday we had on the Howie Carr show, um, when I sat in for Howie Carr, we had Professor Mark Smith, a big friend of this show, um, on the Howie Carr show, we talked about the number one, the arguments, the oral arguments that were heard before the Supreme Court yesterday uh, for the Trump obstruction case uh, that Jack Smith has brought. And it's basically the same argument that they've brought against all the J6, um, the J6ers that they're charging with, basically, that they have obstructed a legal proceeding like the elections uh you know the uh the counting of the votes or certifying the election on january 6th and they're trying to charge them with obstruction which is this case that came about as a result of the enron uh debacle when they were like destroying evidence and trying to hide and cover their tracks so it's a big difference between that and uh, Mark Smith was really amped up about this yesterday because he said it looks really bad for Jack Smith and the Merrick Garland Attorney General's Office, the Department of Justice, to be able to bring this case against J6ers and against Trump, for that matter, because it's a big stretch from what the original intent of the law was. And leave it up to the federal government to stretch things like the ATF does all the time, the EPA, the IRS, and everything else. And so um, he was pretty excited about the oral arguments. He said he thinks it's going to come down as a 6-3 decision in favor of the defendants and not the government. So this is important because it's reining in the power of federal government to really interpret how the law should be applied and try to hammer square pegs into round holes all the time as they do as we so often see them do and how they so often got away with for so long under chevron um this isn't specific to chevron but it's still a really important case um to watch and look at also we saw um some movement in the oregon ballot initiative 114 which for those who don't know what that is, that was a ballot initiative that passed on razor thin margins. It was probably less than 1% of the vote, like basically 50, 50 vote, but it was like 50 and a half to 49 and a half. Um, or, you know, there might've been some other mix in there, but it was razor thin margins where the people actually voted to do away with their constitutional right to keep and bear arms and ban guns that are in common and ordinary use, ban high capacity magazines or standard capacity magazines. And um, the interesting thing there is that it looks like the 
the there was an injunction or uh, a uh, I, I guess I can't fully articulate this the way Mark Smith did so well yesterday, but the bottom line is uh, it it will not be imposed until it's had its full day in court. So because this law um, was challenged right away, it won't go into effect until oral arguments have been heard and a final decision has been rendered. So it might get picked up uh, and go to the like the Oregon Supreme Court. And depending on how they rule, it might be appealed to the Supreme Court. But regardless, the people aren't going to have to live with the implementation of the law until it's had its final judgment, wherever that might be. So that's huge. Um, on a local note, we had Maine, the Senate passed a number of exec, extreme anti-gun bills. There's an article about it yesterday on uh, Ammo Land. And late Friday night, April 12th, the Maine Senate passed a number of extreme anti-gun bills. These bills include 72-hour waiting periods on firearms purchases and transfers, redefining semi-automatic firearms as machine guns, and implementing universal background check laws in Maine. These bills undermine Mainers' constitutional rights and would destroy Maine's robust firearm and hunting tourism industries. Despite these facts, several rural lawmakers voted for Michael Bloomberg's gun control bills in Maine. NRA members and gun rights supporters are encouraged to contact these lawmakers now and express their concerns regarding these votes. Senate President Troy Jackson, uh, Democrat from Aroostook, Senator Tim Nagel, Democrat of Cumberland, Senator Chip Curry, Democrat of Waldo, Senator Cameron Rene of Lincoln, Senator Dave LaFontaine of Kennebec, and Senator Mike Tripping, Democrat of Penobscot, all uh, voted in favor of this. Um, and I guess there's going to be a lobby day on Monday, April 15th, which was a few days ago, um, for uh, gun rights uh, to talk to lawmakers about the danger of Michael Bloomberg's gun control agenda. Anti-gun advocates have called the Lewiston tragedy a golden opportunity. They love dancing in the blood of victims and their last chance to pass the radical gun control demands in Maine. We've beaten Bloomberg before and we can do it again, but we need you to show up and have your voice heard. State house doors open at eight. They will be in session starting around 10. And we need you to talk to our legislators to educate them on why these gun bills are bad for Maine. Drop in and stay as long as you can. All right. Obviously this event already happened. So therefore, it's really important to reach out to each and every one of your legislators if you're living in Maine. Uh, some of the talking points can also be found on the Ammo Land website. But if you go to uh, info at gunownersofmaine.org, that's the state organization that is um, fighting this un unconstitutional legislation and um, yeah, it's bad, 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 bad. Well, it's funny you should ask, White Wolf, what's in the Beretta box. And yes, uh, you were correct that it is a 1301 shotgun. And it's a very special 1301 shotgun. And I can't really reveal why it's so special yet. But you'll see some social media announcements very soon on why that shotgun is so special so we're gonna drop out that out on social media but um anyway so i did a video a few weeks ago after i got back from the colorado state house warning how gun control is spreading like a disease a bad virus throughout this country and that's the biggest argument i have against everybody who writes on Every single one of my videos about mask on law updates, move, 
Why do you live there? Move out of state. You're crazy to live in this state. Well, Maine, the way life should be, just passed ridiculous gun control laws in the Senate. And so everybody who just moved from Massachusetts to get out of our onerous gun control laws so that they don't have to stay and fight them, get up to where the way life should be in Maine, guess what? What are you going to do now? Are you going to leave Maine and go to Tennessee? Are you going to leave Tennessee and go to Georgia? Are you going to leave Georgia and go to Florida? Are you going to, you got to have your map, you know, charted out. Is everybody going to end up in Texas or Florida someday? Um, the, the point I'm trying to make is if we just turn tail and run every time legislation is introduced, then guess what? We lose. We don't want one state to fall, not one. But so many people are willing to concede and just leave and just, you know, write a state or two off. And that is not the, uh, that is definitely not the way we want to go. We want to make sure that um, our rights are preserved wherever they are challenged. Here's another reason to think about this. Ron Mariano, when he introduced HD 4420 via Michael Day's office, the um, Senate Judiciary, I mean, the House Judiciary Committee chairman, um, and after the listening tour, and they had this packaged up gun control agenda from Giffords, I, I, I want to believe it was Giffords and Mons Demand Action that had the most influence on this bill. And when they served that up, Ron Mariano said, we are hoping that this will serve as a template for not only other states, but for the federal government. So their agenda is to make this happen throughout the world, throughout the country, and federally as well. So they love to point to the successes of gun control. And nothing could be further from the truth. The fact remains that gun control fails every time it's tried, while the freedom works every time it's tried. Now, granted, um, freedom can be more dangerous than control, right? But we all will acknowledge that control is not something that we want to live with. We want to live with freedom as our founders intended because that's what the human spirit yearns for. That's what the human, that's what's innate in every human. We want freedom. We want to be able to do what we want to do. We want to be able to worship who we want to worship. We want to be able to go wherever we want to go. We want to work for whoever we want to work for. And we also acknowledge that we want to um, have the right that is natural to defend ourselves and our family and be able to uh, draw on that with the most efficient means necessary. And the the best tool for the job, from what I can see, is a firearm. So a perfect example of that is look at the terrible, tragic stabbings that happened in gun-free Australia. Um, we saw in a mall, five women and one security guard get stabbed to death in a mall in a matter of seconds or minutes. And it wasn't even, there was some brave people that went and like tried to surround and confront, but it wasn't until the security guard or the police officer with the gun 
ran and shot him that it really ended. And that's, that's what, uh, that's, what's really important. If you think about it, that is the most efficient tool. Like you get grappling with dude with a big knife. You might buy the pine pajamas, if you know what I mean, in the process, you'll be a hero. You'll be a martyr. You'll, you'll go down in the, on the front page of the paper as a hero, your family will be able to hang their head high and say, man, what courage, but there's a more efficient way, like stand outside of that two arms length, two arms reach and use the tools that we have available to us. It's not that complicated, but yet in Australia, they prefer unarmed subjects. So <clears throat> that's um, what we see here going on. Um, and speaking of Colorado, uh, did I speak of Colorado? Yes, I made a video when I got back from Colorado. I finally got the video of me testifying before the state house. So um, I'm going to show you guys that if you don't mind. Um, it's just a quick two minute video, but, um, I'm going to see if I can download it and it doesn't look like I can. Yeah, I can. All right. Because if I download it, it'll play a lot better on this software. So, um, yeah. So let me add the video clip and then uh, I'll try to juice up the sound as best I can because it's, it's a little hard to hear, and I, I apologize for that. I bet I could go back to their stream and clip it, and it's probably better audio, better video, and everything. Uh, but you'll see where the my open letter to my own legislators came from, because this is kind of what sent me down that thought process. Um, so I know you guys have heard that, but um, I want to share what I actually testified before the Colorado State House. So. And this was one when I got back to my seat, a bunch of people around stood up and shook my hand as I was going to my seat. And I was kind of like, are you shaking my hand because you liked what I said or because I traveled from Massachusetts? And I didn't ask. I'm just thankful that they wanted to stand up and shake my hand. So, all right, here it is. Thank you. Um, my name is Tony Larry, and I'm from Massachusetts. I might have the record for the furthest travel to be here today. But I was born in Denver, and I feel a kinship to the state of Colorado. Massachusetts is still living under an expanded version of the 94 assault weapons ban, and our state made it permanent in 1998. Mass also passed sweeping comprehensive gun control, which resulted in a checkerboard of unconstitutional laws that constantly keeps us in fear of inadvertently running afoul of confusing and arbitrary laws. In 98, we had 1.2 million gun owners in the Bay State. Since then, we have seen a mass exodus of families from uh, by individuals who prefer freedom, and we are now seeing a thousand people per week leave the state. This has resulted in half the licensed gun owners in the Bay State as we hover around 600,000. Ironically, though, that violent crime with a firearm has increased 120% since 1998, in spite of being one of the most restrictive states in the country. The net result of disarming peaceful and responsible citizens are, is the criminals who don't follow comprehensive gun bans or any laws for that matter have more of defenseless citizens to take advantage of. I ask you a simple question today. It's serious though. If you could gain enough support in both chambers to pass a law to ban Catholics, could you do it? I think if you're intellectually honest, you would say no. That's because of what James Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers, something called constitutional limitations. He also went on to write that legislators have a very special role in government, which is they, because they are from the people, the blood of the people, that they are the gatekeepers of our rights. I don't know where the, flip, uh, the script got flipped, but just like you couldn't ban a certain religion, you cannot ban their arms. You lack the constitutional authority. But so many in this chamber will do it anyway because you possess the power to do so. Uh, this is an abuse of power. Vote no on this bill. All right, thank you, members. All right, thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> uh, so 
Yeah, that was hopefully you could hear it. And, um, it, you know, the general theme of it anyway was uh, what I've been trying to get across of how they lack the constitutional authority to do what they're doing, but they're going to do it anyway. Now, we also saw, as I think it was Noah pointed out, that uh, they ended up listen, not listening to the people. There were 200,000 200, petitions that were signed saying, lay off the Second Amendment. Um, and the bottom line is they passed it anyway. So um, it was really sad to see. Um, it is definitely unconstitutional. One of the things that um, it really shows is that there is a collaboration with these gun control groups like Giffords and um, Moms Demand Action in the same way that Massachusetts collaborated with. Like if you read the wording in these bills, they are almost identical. There's little nuance to them. Their bill actually goes one step further than Massachusetts, um, where it'll ban pistols with a threaded muzzle, um, which is extremely interesting because you can legally own suppressors in Mass in uh, Colorado. So if you can own a suppressor, how are you supposed to attach it if the gun with the threaded muzzle is banned? It doesn't make any sense. They are going down to a one feature test and just it's pretty much the exact excuse me the exact wording of the Massachusetts assault weapons ban. The two sponsors of the bill, Epps and uh, I think it was Hernandez. Uh, Epps is from San Francisco. Hernandez is from Colorado, who um, was appointed instead of elected because of an opening in the House. So he was not even voted in. And he's the one who's a card carrying communist. So he's an avowed communist. Um, and yet here he is trying to strip people of their right to keep and bear arms. Uh, unbelievable and unconstitutional all at the same time. And it, it did pass the full house vote along with some other, uh, gun control. They have a lot of gun control on their agenda, very similar to Massachusetts. And so I said all that to say this. They are a very well-funded group, very well-organized group. And they are, and this is what Mark Smith pointed out on Howie Carr for anyone who caught it yesterday, was they are pushing hard in the states in which they control the House, the Senate, and the governor's office and the judicial branches. So there's democratically appointed judges, Democrat governor, Democrat controlled House and Senate. These are the areas where they are pushing the most. Um, so that's that's a problem. And uh, sorry, Arlo, <laughs> my dog is making it hard to breathe in here. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, that's their agenda right now is jam up the courts, jam up the House, jam up the Senate, get bills passed, anti-gun bills passed, knowing full well that it is going to take a decade to go worm its way through the court system. It's going to take time unless something like what happens in Oregon, which again, took a long time, but the full implementation of it. The problem with a state like Massachusetts is we already have the bill. So typically courts will maintain the status quo of the law if it's challenged. So because the court, I mean, the people haven't lived under this weapons ban or the magazine ban in, in Oregon, that's one of the reasons the courts uh, the courts 
decided to uh, enjoin that that bill. Let's let's read it. Um, it uh, I believe there's a good article on yes. Again, on Ammo Land, Oregon court allows Measure 114 Smackdown to stand for now. Oregon gun owners are breathing a little easier, unlike their colleagues north of the Columbia River, now that Oregon Court of Appeals has decided not to override the ruling by Harney County Circuit Judge Robert Rascio that Measure 114 was unconstitutional last November. The state appealed, but the appeals court declined to override the judge's decision at least for the time being. And again, that's because of that whole status quo type thing. Measure 114 was a restrictive gun control measure that would require a permit to purchase firearms, mandate training courses, apply for a permit, and also ban the sale and manufacture of cartridge magazines that can hold more than 10 rounds. In neighboring Washington, a Cowlitz County Superior Court judge declared the Evergreen State's ban on so-called large capacity magazines unconstitutional, but a state Supreme Court commissioner quickly stayed that ruling. Responding to the decision, Oregon uh, Firearms Federation noted in its bulletin and its members and supporters, this is very good news in a very anti-gun state. We are grateful for the excellent work Tony Aiello is doing in this case. We are also grateful for the assistance from FPC and 2AF in, its mat in this matter. However, the organization cautioned members that this fight is far from over and it's asking for donations to continue to funding two lawsuits. Um, so the just because the Supreme Court of Oregon struck down the appeal for, by the uh, by the state or ruled in favor for the uh, defendants instead of the state, um, they I guess that would make them the plaintiffs. Uh, the state would probably be the defendants. Um, they they urge people to not back down and continue to fund it because they know that the Oregon Supreme Court is a very liberal court. So that's that battle might be just kicked. The can might have just been kicked down the street. The state had wanted M114 to take effect, but the appeals court turned the state down. The appellate court seems to be dragging things out on this issue, according to KGW. The court repeatedly sent a 119-day deadline from Friday, April 12th, so the two sides in this case can submit legal arguments and responses. At this point, it may be open to speculation about what is happening in the Pacific Northwest. Oregon and Washington have a history of independence until recent years, when Democrat minorities in both states managed to capture the legislative minorities, majorities, excuse me, in Salem and Olympia, respectively. Both states have had a string of Democrat governors who have been leaning farther left. They have not been friendly to gun owners on either side of the Columbia River. So this, again, is what we're seeing. This type of thing pass in a democratically controlled state that used to be red, went purple, and is now blue, just like Colorado. So for all those who want to, you know, punt and kick the can down the road, I caution you to stay and fight wherever that fight might be found. And I get it. There's other reasons to leave, not just the gun thing, uh, taxes and the way of life and, you know, restrictions and all that good stuff. I understand. I'm not saying just don't, <laughs> don't comply. I'm just, or leave and go somewhere else I'm, for other reasons. I'm just saying, if your sole reason for wanting to leave the state is because of the 2A thing, I think you're crazy because the you got a gift wrapped fight right here. You don't have to travel somewhere else. Like I went to Colorado. I didn't have to do that, but I thought it was important. So anyway, all right, we were going to, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back after this. I'm Toby Leary. Vortex offers the very best optics specifically made for shooters with rugged construction designed for extreme environments. Vortex Optics build quality ensures accurate, reliable, and repeatable performance every time you squeeze the trigger. Add fully multi-coated lenses and nitrogen purging and you have a quality optic with an extremely reasonable price tag. That is the Vortex difference. Come into Cape Gunworks to see the full line of Vortex Optics today. Federal ammunition is 100. This is where the American ingenuity met a trailblazing spirit. 
Hard work united with patriotism and technology blended with new ideas. That's federal ammunition. Right here in Anoka, Minnesota, born in 1922, made in America, and proud to be the best. Federal ammunition, a century of innovation. Carrying a firearm for personal protection has never been more popular than it is today. The USCCA can help fortify your home, sharpen your awareness, and develop your defensive plan. Go to uscca.co forward slash rapid fire to sign up. Your family's safety and security is your responsibility. Go to uscca.co forward slash rapid fire to sign up for a USCCA membership and get special training, legal advice, and legal protection you and your family need. Welcome back to Rapid Fire. I'm your host, Toby Leary. Join us each and every week right here. Same bad time, same bad channel, except when it doesn't happen. <laughs> I try to make it happen every week, but sometimes something comes up, life gets in the way. And uh, you can follow us if you go to whatever social media platform you use regularly at Cape Gunworks and at Rapid Fire Radio all one word. And please follow us and give us a like and a subscribe and a share and a comment. And uh, you'll you'll be up to date. So thank you guys for all of you who do that. Uh, but the only way we're going to get the word out is if you guys help because I'm shadow banned. My whole Facebook account is just completely shut down. And so yeah, that's what that's what we one of the sad sad uh states of affairs and the facebook thing i don't even know what it is they didn't tell me what i did wrong they just said no you can't upload anymore and i see like comments come in they block the comments like i know a lot of people have been like hey what's going on with your facebook account i can't see who it is i can't see the comment i just see blocked 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 like comments i can't so it's absurd but that's what is going on so Anyway, hopefully that'll all change someday, um, <laughs> but you never know. Um, all right, so let's get into some of the other news. Uh, we talked about Maine. We talked about uh, Oregon. We talked about um, the the whole uh, the whole uh, oral arguments before the Supreme Court. Um, we're still really hoping that SCOTUS takes a ban case an assault weapons ban case um i don't know that they will but let's hope and pray um we got uh th i talked about the knife attack in australia um and yeah we got a uh, oh i saw this article on um yesterday when i was filling in for the howie car show how California is really nervous right now because um, there was, because of the the porous southern border in San Diego, um, more and more people are buying firearms. They've had an unprecedented number of firearms sold in recent months uh, because of the Porous border. That's the what at least what the media is connecting the dots to. Um, and they are nervous that the state is gonna get involved. Uh, they already have a one gun per month law, so I don't know how they could get involved beyond that. Um, but the the question is, are they gonna get involved to prohibit the purchasing of firearms further? Or are they going to get involved and shut the southern border? There's an article here about uh, California ban on carrying firearms for non-residents has been challenged. So this is really going to be making them nervous. On April 11, 2024, a lawsuit was filed against Rob Bonta in his capacity as Attorney General of California. The lawsuit contends California infringes on the rights protected by the Second Amendment of the Bill of Rights by prohibiting United States citizens who are non-residents of California from exercising rights protected by the Second Amendment of the state. So we saw this, a similar challenge 
in Massachusetts, we had two, two favorable outcomes. One was on the Patriots player, Jack Jones, and one was on a guy, a New Hampshire resident, um, who went to Lowell District Court and got a favorable outcome. As a result of that, I heard that the state is going to be appealing that decision. But uh, basically, the judge who wrote the opinion on that said, you don't surrender your rights just because you cross state lines. He's like, you can still go to church in whatever state you want. Like, you don't have to get a special permit or license if you go to another state in order to go to church, right? And he pointed out accurately so that if you are shopping in the Pheasant Lane Mall in New Hampshire, there's one end of the mall that actually crosses the state line into Tingsboro. And if you are a New Hampshire resident and you go shopping in that mall and you wander into that end of the mall that's in Massachusetts, have you now broken Massachusetts law? He said that's absurd. So that's good. Uh, California, however, per prevents law-abiding citizens of the United States who do not reside in California from exercising their constitutionally protected right to carry loaded operable firearms in public. State law generally prohibits individuals from carrying firearms either openly or concealed in public, and non-residents are not eligible for a license to carry a firearm in public. Indeed, and also New York is this way as well. Um, Indeed, California's unconstitutionally restrictive scheme provides no path for non-residents to carry a firearm lawfully in public at all. As a result, individuals like plaintiffs Hoffman, Oren, and uh, Senseba, who have been issued carry licenses in their respective home states and are allowed by other states that either do not require a license or which offer reciprocity based upon the licenses they hold are barred from lawfully carrying a firearm in public for self-defense when they visit California. Boy, oh boy, would this be a great, uh, this would be great to have if, you know, the two other states could enjoin this, like New York, and uh, I forget what the other state is that will not issue a non-resident license to carry. But, um, Maybe it's Hawaii, uh, but regardless, that that would be great. So that's something to um, to look at. It might be New Jersey, actually. Uh, it says, yeah, no, that's old. Never mind. Um, it's an interesting article, anyway. So check that out um, on amoland.com. Uh, so I'm going to get to the chat. Uh, hopefully you guys got a chance to, um, listen to the Howie Carr show the last couple of days. I know I pushed it out on social media. I didn't have any way of, um, co-streaming that from their studio. Um, uh, but the good news is I have a Comrex now. So if I ever do fill in for them in my studio, I'll be able to push it out there. So that's good. Um, but we got lots of stuff on the move. Um, great, some good court rulings. We've had lots of uh, we've had lots of the uh, what do you call it? Um, red state challenges to gun control. Um, kind of win case by case by case by case continually but some of the blue states this is where a lot of the democratically appointed judges um kind of fall down and fail uh that is where the concerted efforts are so we're going to continue to see that um which i really hope is a area where we can concentrate on trying to get uh, cases up to the Supreme Court level. The problem is it costs a ton of money, takes a lot of time, and they can just not take the case. As we saw in Warman v. Healy, um, that made it all the way to the Supreme Court and wasn't granted cert. So a lot going on. But all right. Uh, 
there's an article in Bearing Arms about a New Jersey legislator. This It says New Jersey legislators discover criminals don't care about their gun laws. Well, huh. Wonder where you've heard that. Back in 2018, Governor Phil Murphy proudly touted the signing of a bill making it illegal in New Jersey to purchase parts to manufacture or distribute information to print ghost guns, which the governor described as homemade or 3D printed firearms that are untraceable by law enforcement. As lawmakers learned this week, however, Garden State scoff laws don't seem to be paying much attention to the prohibition. The State Commission on Investigation uh, held a hearing in Trenton on the issue this week at the behest of Democratic Assemblyman Herb Conway Jr. Um, and discovered that banning something doesn't make it go away. Because they're untraceable, ghost guns tend to be used in multiple crimes. And I would like to add a little asterisk here to the term ghost gun, which is, uh, yeah, I know, I know, it's a propaganda term, but one of the categories of ghost gun that has been lumped in with homemade or 3D printed guns to kind of get the numbers up are guns with obliterated serial numbers. So, um, you know, whenever they say the ghost gun numbers, that doesn't always mean it's an untraceable firearm that was made in someone's basement with a 3D printer. Just, just a little asterisk. Because they're untraceable, Ghost guns tend to be used in multiple crimes, becoming what police call multi-shoot guns or community guns used multiple times in a short period of time, often in the same community. Investigators and officers who testified Tuesday said investigators shared maps showing shootings that ballistic text tests pinned on the same ghost gun in Newark. Investigators linked one ghost gun still unrecovered to 10 shootings over 18 months that left four people injured, including a nine-year-old boy and two 17-year-olds. In Trenton, they tied one ghost gun to five shootings over four months that left two people dead and nine injured. That gun was recovered. Seizure data also show that uptick in ghost guns with recoveries rising 600% between 2019 and last year, state police data shows. Police in New Jersey recovered a about one ghost gun a week in 2019, but that soared to almost one a day by last year, an investigator said. 600% increase isn't an uptick. That's massive increase. And it didn't matter that the state had already criminalized even downloading the files necessary to print parts on a 3D printer. While the New Jersey law is facing a court challenge, so far the federal judiciary has declined to issue an injunction that would block enforcement of the statute. It remains fully in effect and completely ineffective at stopping or changing criminal behavior. So what's a lawmaker to do? Make more laws, of course. And this is really where the focus of the conference committee lies right now is ghost guns. They're, they're nervous about guns that are found in crime that were unserialized or untraceable or homemade or 3D printed. Investigators... Uh, Tuesday said lawmakers must act to close gaps in the law. They suggest cracking down on online purveyors of gun parts and computer codes that enable people to print firearm parts and heightening penalties for an, an expanding pretrial detention of gun offenders found to have possessed or used ghost guns or guns used in multiple shootings. Recent efforts statewide to crack down on repeat gun offenders have contributed to the downward trend in shootings. Well, there you go. But how does one become a repeat gun offender? Don't you have mandatory minimums for criminals in possession of firearms? So what's that gun offender doing out on the street? Uh, I digress. Legislators also should criminalize the public discharge of a firearm outside of permitted shooting like hunting and target practice and beef up penalties for people who fire guns at certain places, much like drug offenses are weightier when committed in school zones, investigators said. It's all a bunch of blah, 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 as Greta Thunberg likes to say, blah, 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 blah. Because guess what? 
the only people who suffer the consequences of these type of laws are the lawful law abiding people who get jammed up in the crosshairs of unconstitutional laws because you get said gangbanger who's on his 15th offense who shouldn't be out walking the street gets arrested with fentanyl illegal possession of a gun um assault with a deadly weapon shooting at a police officer in a gun-free zone and guess what like most of those charges get dropped they they charge them with the two or three most heinous offenses and then he's out walking the streets in a few years again so you know this is all a bunch of unbelievable uh unconstitutional restrictions upon the people who we don't have to worry about that's what this article says who would have guessed that cracking down on the most prolific violent offenders would lead to a drop in shootings you don't need to ban hardware software 3d printers or gun parts to reduce violent crime in fact doing that is a waste of time focusing on the people who are pulling the trigger is the single most effective way to improve public safety but new jersey legislators would much rather go after lawful gun owners and I would say they're not that dumb. They're doing it on purpose. They need the narrative, but let's not go down that road right now. While investigators claim that this targeted approach is paying off, they also ignored one other big factor, the rise in concealed carry holders. There are now more than 30,000 New Jersey residents with an active carry license, an increase in almost 3,000% compared to the pre-Bruin May issue numbers. Gun control activists and politicians like Phil Murphy were certain that the spike in concealed carry was going to lead to more violent crime. Let's put that one in a little shoebox for a minute. Um, but I want to come back to that. Uh, let's see here. Gun control activists, uh, I, I talked about that. Uh, but instead, the number of shootings in the state dropped to its lowest recorded level which at least suggests that the growing number of armed citizens is having an impact on the behavior of violent offenders. New Jersey's law prohibiting the dissemination of computer code is a violation of our First Amendment rights, as far as I'm concerned. Amen to that. And it's a ban on home-built guns violates the Second Amendment as well. Not to mention um, a violation of Heller and Bruin. And I'll try to remember to come back to that because I want to I don't want to forget where I am on this. Um, but uh, there were no bans on home-built guns in 1791 or in 1868. Those statues are all modern creations with no analog in our nation's history. And they fail the Supreme Court's test, history, and tradition test. So far, the courts have resisted throwing out the law, but ultimately the decision will rest with SCOTUS. As long as they faithfully apply their own reasoning, I don't think the law stands a chance of surviving. All right. So here's something I am going to try to articulate. And this is something I've been ruminating on. And I'm going to do my best to explain it the way it goes through my head and have it make sense to you. Here goes. When you look at the arguments of gun control activists one of the most beautiful uh depictions of this was on uh the new mexico governor what was her name lee jean campbell or something like that i can't remember her name to be honest uh but when she was doing the news circuits even like cnn was like uh you think banning the Second Amendment is going to pass constitutional muster? <laughs> but you listen to what the words that come out of their mouth is. I want my family to feel like they're safe when they're at the supermarket or at the polling place or at the playground or in the public parks and not worry about a guy with a gun. So the natural, logical next question is, Oh, so you think by putting a sign on the tree of the park saying this is a gun-free zone, the criminals are going to say, darn it, I was just going to go shoot up a whole bunch of kids, but 
there's a sign on the tree that says I can't bring a gun in here. And she said, no, I don't think criminals are going to abide by that. But we don't need guns in these places. And so it paints a very sharp picture of government's distrust for the people that they allegedly represent. I've sort of brought this thought out before when I was 18 years old and I remember my license to carry data being stored at CGIS, the Department of Criminal Justice or the Criminal Justice Information Service, which is a the same service that keeps track of inmates and convicted felons and sex offenders. And I, I took great offense at that. I said, wait, wait, what? Like, why would a lawful gun owner's information be kept in the same database as the Criminal Justice Information Services database? Why would those people be tasked with keeping track of the lawful gun owners in the state of Massachusetts. So it started to cause me to think, well, they have a serious distrust of me and think that at some point I'm going to go psycho and use my gun in a negative way. That seems to be the logic. Or B, the one day the law will change and I'm already in the system. They just got to flick the switch from lawful to unlawful. And now it's just like a warrant goes out for your arrest. They know what you got. They know what you're doing. And you're, you haven't done anything except wake up and the law changed. And now you're a felon. We've seen this come close with the pistol brace thing and the frame and receiver ruling how you know 30 million people could wake up one day and their braced pistols could mean they are a felon we saw hearings about this all right so now if i can land the plane this is the hard part government has a massive distrust of the public at large with a firearm and it is an exact opposite of how our country was founded, which was the people have a natural distrust of government. And that is the healthy direction for any distrust, like being skeptical or intellectually irreverent towards those who make law, those who define law, and those who enforce law and say like, I'm not sure that's how this is supposed to go. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. And the fact remains, I have more trust in the people than I do in the government. So the opposite is true when it comes to government wanting to impose its will on us. And I think we're at this important crossroads. Um, this what really is kind of solidified this thought process in my mind was the debate between Colleon Noir and um, I think his name is Ken, and I might be getting that wrong, but it's something Rosenthal from Stop Handgun Violence in Massachusetts. And this guy wants universal background checks. He wants a ban on assault weapons. He wants a ban on high-capacity magazines. He wants guns just for the uh, FUD purposes. And even though handguns are used in mass shooting events more than long guns, he still wants to ban long guns. And he loves to call them military weapons, weapons of war, weapons, you know, military-grade weaponry. And the fact that he is okay with the government having military-grade weaponry and the police 
having military grade weaponry and excluding the public from having said weapons proves my point that they have more trust in government than they do in the people who are supposed to be represented by the government. I'm not sure I articulated that as clearly as I wanted to, but the truth of the matter is anybody who puts more faith in government doing the right thing towards a disarmed populace isn't working in the best interest of society. They are furthering an agenda, which I believe is very similar to the agenda that King Henry III had, which is once I disarm the people, then I don't have to worry about them rising up or getting upset with you know, taxes and with all the other um, things that I want to impose on them, the restrictions to their freedoms, the restrictions to their lifestyles. And we see like in this bill right here, the one we just talked about um, in New Jersey, where they've already restricted the First Amendment in order to restrict the Second Amendment. Um, so I don't know if I've landed the plane and explained that as lucid as I wanted to, but the the truth of the matter is um, that is the the way that it plays out is our obviously government officials who have bad plans for you want to take away your guns all the while saying the fact that you claim to have guns as a tyrant safety release relief valve is ridiculous because the government has nuclear weapons and F15s and basically I, I've heard President Biden say this I've heard Eric Swalwell say this and they're insinuating that if it got to the point where the people feel government has turned tyrannical, that they would use nukes and tanks and F-15s and bombs on their own people, like that's that's a uh, a violation of the Constitution. Um, you can't do that. But let's see. Um, I would love to have a debate with somebody and call them out on their suspicious nature of the good people that sent them there in the first place. Their suspicious nature of the people who live with freedoms that they want to restrict. All the while, relaxing standards on criminals and reducing sentencing guidelines and allowing multiple felons and career criminals to be back out on the street in rapid time. Um, to me, that seems a little bit upside down. Like you have more faith in the criminals than you do in the lawful. Those of us who are trying our best to dance around the edges and make sure we don't run afoul of the law. So anyway, uh, something to think about guys. And hopefully uh, that all made sense. And I apologize in advance if it didn't, but Sometimes I get a little uh, wordy to try to get out what's in here and make it make sense to the public. And maybe you can help me get a little bit more succinct on that. But anyway, this is Rapid Fire. Uh, don't go away. We will be right back. I got the cool Gun of the Week video coming up and uh, much more to talk about, including your chat. So we'll be right back. This is Rapid Fire. I'm Toby Leary. Thanks so much. Carrying a firearm for personal protection has never been more popular than it is today. The USCCA can help fortify your home, sharpen your awareness, and develop your defensive plan. Go to uscca.co forward slash rapid fire to sign up. Your family safety and security is your responsibility. Go to uscca.co forward slash rapid fire to sign up for a USCCA membership and get special training, legal advice, and legal protection you and your family need. Federal delivers a knockout punch with the leading defensive ammo on the market. 
Federal Punch Hollow Points are accurate and reliable in all defensive situations. When you need reliability designed to provide a balanced mix of effective penetration and expansion, you need Punch Defensive Ammunition from Federal, the leader in nickel-plated brass ammo with a sealed primer to deliver reliable feeding and ignition. Get Federal Punch Defensive Hollow Point Ammunition here at Cape Gunworks. Vortex offers the very best optics specifically made for shooters with rugged construction designed for extreme environments. Vortex Optics build quality ensures accurate, reliable, and repeatable performance every time you squeeze the trigger. Add fully multi-coated lenses and nitrogen purging and you have a quality optic with an extremely reasonable price tag. That is the Vortex difference. Come into Cape Gunworks to see the full line of Vortex Optics today. Welcome back to Rapid Fire. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, comment, and spread the word far and wide with friends, neighbors, relatives, enemies, and coworkers. All about Cape Gunworks and Rapid Fire Radio, and uh, I will be forever in your debt. So thank you to each and every one of you for tuning in each and every week. Um, let's jump in the chat and uh, answer some questions, because I know there's been some good ones, I think. Um, white wolf, I would love to, but the, the honey badger, it's kind of my gun, even though it never leaves Cape Gunworks. And there's this thing in this state, believe it or not, suppressors are more highly regulated than machine guns. And there's really no provision in the law that I can find that would allow me to rent suppressors so there it is uh what are the odds that this new bill in mass passes i have faith given how egregious it is but it really is likely this thing comes into fruition well let's make no mistake matt that it already passed the house it already passed the senate they're just trying to hash out the differences of the bill and so they can take a final vote and send it to the state house uh send it to the the governor's desk so it has passed both chambers of congress and we don't know what the final version will look like but as i said in a the earlier segment i know they're hot to trot about ghost guns they got a you know thing across their you know what for that so um that's something that is likely to come out of committee and go to the floor and go to the house the senate for a vote for a final vote um they don't have to send it to the public to debate they don't have to have hearings they don't have to debate it internally it's going to go right to the floor for an up or down vote the final version so they might debate it but i doubt it bloomberg should be asked how many armed bodyguards he keeps around him well, it's because of people like you and me that he has to have bodyguards, right? So that's what, you know, if it wasn't for all the gun owners, he wouldn't need armed bodyguards, which we all know not to be true. Um, we saw that horrible attack on that priest in Australia, Sydney, Australia, that was live streamed. Um, I think his name is Mari, Mari Emanuel or something like that, but um a bishop in the i think orthodox church and some psycho rushed the stage with a knife and stabbed him live on the air while they live streamed it and uh that's a state that doesn't have guns right you can't have a firearm to protect yourself even if you have one because you live in the like the the bush and you're way out in the country and like if somebody breaks in your house and you shoot them with a gun, you're going to jail. Straight to jail. Straight to jail. All right. Uh, thank you for the thumbs up, everybody, and the likes and subscribes. I appreciate it. Um, it could be, Fred, he says, revolution is the answer. I think we definitely need um, a concerted voice. A well, a concerted effort and one unified voice. Um, and, 
yeah, I think peace is still an option. So <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I don't need no stinking constitution nor the Supreme Judicial Court said so Joe Biden. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, you know, that came up yesterday on the Howie Carr Show with Professor Mark Smith. I was just saying how I was happy that um, Merrick Garland wasn't on the Supreme Court because, I mean, he could he have been an impartial justice? I don't think so. And I also, you know, juxtaposed how I believe that the six uh, judges that ruled in favor of Bruin, I believe that they do hear all cases kind of agenda free. And maybe I'm looking through rose colored glasses, but I do feel like they have the constitution at heart and take that serious. They're like, you know, constructionists or strict um, con constitutionalists. And he said that the other three, you know, the Soda Myers and the, um, et cetera, are uh, more of a living document type of jurist. So they don't believe in the letter of the law as the Constitution is written. They believe it is a living, breathing document that can be changed or interpreted or, or kind of massaged through technology and modern law modern living so and we saw that on full display with the cargill arguments so you know you'd hear like justice barrett and justice um i think it was gorsuch talking about single function of the trigger what that is and how it is and blah 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 and, and then you heard i think it was sort of my air who's a very intelligent uh brilliant woman who really was like, ah, yeah, I know what the single function of the trigger definition means, but what is the intent of the shooter? And what is the actual result of, you know, using this particular device, like a bump stock? So there you have it. It's like, she doesn't care about what the actual definition by Congress is. It's like the intent of the shooter is to shoot as fast as I can. Well, shoot, that would ban Jerry Michalik's finger, right? Because he can shoot pretty darn fast. But, you know, again, um, what would the intent of the shooter be is this weird um, trip lullaby of, <laughs> of you know, I mean, subjective thought. It would be su subjectivity. It would be whoever thinks you're shooting too fast now could charge you with possession of a machine gun. So uh, we saw that. Also, we saw her qualify that statement with, I am a very textual jurist. So she teed it up by saying she's normally the person who looks at the plain text of the, of the, constitution or the in this case the constitution or the bill of rights or the um the right and she goes but <laughs> or the law for that matter but and you always get the but right the big butts always come out and so um you know that's really what it comes down to uh mike says for the most part they don't care what we say we can talk until we're blue in the face but they've already made up their minds that was on full display in colorado and, um, you know, even they even admitted it. Uh, Rep Epps said, she said, I, I know everybody's minds already made up how they're going to vote on this. And no one's going to we're not going to change any minds here today by my testimony or by anyone else's testimony. And I'm like, what? That is crazy. Um, so yeah. Um, American Patriot. Let's see. Uh, where did you buy your SIG? Because what I've learned, they're hard to find. Everyone wants it. Um, are we talking about the SIG MCX here? Because um, if we're talking about the SIG MCX, I have them in stock. Uh, so 
yeah um or the 1301 we have those in stock as well uh let's see i know it's an earlier comment but here we go yeah six brlt um yeah we have those in stock so easy to get um and uh you'll be able to get it an american patriot got his at shooting supply in westport but i think he sold out of the 10 he had could always go there and have him order one uh just have to pay up front um a little selfish self-promotion here we have them in stock as we speak um so there you go and if you're not local i'll ship so there you have that yes fake book has blocked me i got zuckerberg um opinion on yunkin vetoing anti-gun bills in the state of virginia i applaud it that's a uh that's a good golf clap good job yunkin good job that was a standing o more of that please um hopefully uh hopefully they have not a large enough margin to override his veto and i haven't looked into that but um this is an interesting thought to a fred he says boycott california i would like to know what you mean by that um and also if it, you mean not sending to a stuff to California, I think that's a really bad idea. I think we should really support the 2A communities in banned states. Like I live in Massachusetts. I can't stand the fact that Palmetto State Armory won't do business with Massachusetts. They will not ship me a roll pin. Bravo Company, I like their products a lot will not ship to massachusetts um i hate that approach there's a lot of firearms instructors who will not come do classes in massachusetts i think that is a very selfish approach um you're penalizing the people who are the good people on your side by the state they live in i don't think that's right I think they should get more support. So hopefully, uh, I'm not sure that's what you mean, but maybe you mean like driving there and giving them your hard earned dollars and going on vacation and buying goods and services from that state, which again, I don't think the people should be punished who are good people trying to eke out a living for the insanity of the governor and the legislatures and the attorney generals there and the courts that are there and again you can't just say well then they should move like that's not fair either um yeah uh so i i boycott people who are anti-gun okay like i could see that like if some company comes out and says like you don't have a right to keep and bear arms or you should not be able to buy guns or this is a gun-free zone don't come here with any guns like i can understand that um let's see uh yeah that's true um community in that context means gang way to intentionally confuse the jargon yeah they want to make it sound like down at the local gun club this local gun community uh shot up the neighborhood like no they didn't um yeah I, I agree that there's lots of ways of uh mixing up and conflating data so that it looks bad um let's see in california they are out in a lot of cases within hours of being arrested yeah that's that's unfortunately the case here in massachusetts too uh when i was in the military i carried an M4 that had a full auto capability. Have not seen one of those for sale in any store I've been to. Uh, good point, Dave. That's the true definition of a assault weapon. And by the way, what is the definition of arms under Heller? It is any arm 
any bearable arm that is useful for offensive or defensive purposes. So I would argue that machine guns fit that definition and that are in common and ordinary use can't be banned. So you might be able to argue that machine guns aren't in common in ordinary use based on the restrictions put on by the NFA in 1934 and the Hughes Amendment, Hughes Act in 1986. But there's still hundreds of thousands of them in circulation as far as I know. And we all remember what the Supreme Court ruled in the Caetano case that there were 200,000 stun guns in circulation in America, which was enough to satisfy the common and ordinary. Um, I think there's 175,000 machine guns in that are registered machine guns. But if you take the ones that are for military and law enforcement out of the equation, that number drops precipitously. But I think if military and police use them, then they're in common and ordinary use and should not be banned. I don't want to try to bring that argument ahead of the assault weapons ban and the magazine capacity ban and the sensitive locations prohibitions and the licensing uh, schemes. Like, I like what Mark Smith said, you got to win the battle, one battle at a time, like one island at a time. And you went to Iwo Jima, you went to uh, Okinawa, you went to, you know, you didn't go just win the whole war with one fail swoop. You can't win it all in one battle. It's not, you might lose the war if you try to package it up that way, get momentum, get a head of steam. So anyway, but I personally believe that machine guns should be sold. Same as non-machine guns. Uh, how will the new rule affect Massachusetts with four transfers a year? And are they essentially a ban on all sales by non-NFL? Non-FFL. Um, I don't think this is going to really affect the everyday person in Massachusetts at all. However, you know, it all comes down to how the ATF will enforce it because technically, if you sell the gun for a profit, you're in the business of buying and selling machine guns. And I think the only um, machine guns, listen to me, got machine guns on the brain. Um, you're in the business of buying and selling guns. And there are people who are hobbyists that buy and sell guns for a profit that aren't FFLs. And I think that's who it's going to affect first. However, in Massachusetts, if you get a, a table at the local gun show and you stack it up with guns for sale, you're already satisfying this rule change because they're not doing face-to-face -face transfers, they're going over to a table with an FFL and paying a transfer fee to the FFL. But technically, they're engaged in the business of buying and selling firearms. And I don't know that that is really who they... That's ultimately who the ATF is going to crack down on, I think. Um, not the dude who has a gun in his collection and he wants to sell it and he made money on it. However the potential is there. So um, it's that's how I think it's going to affect us. Um, let's see. Uh, thank you. You never know. Um, I recall Judge Sotomayor being concerned with the guns firing 8,000 rounds a second. Yeah, I, I think that was Katanji Brown, but um, I know what you mean. Uh, somebody said that like, oh, but what about the guns that you know, if they fire 8,000 rounds a second, or I'm not a gun expert, but, you know, I know I've asked this question, get laughed at, but I have to ask, uh, you don't have a layaway program. Yes, we do. Yes, I do. I have a layaway program. So the way we do it is um, we like to get half down, but we don't always do that. And we like to have it paid off in 30 days. 
but we don't always do that either. If you need extra time, we can work with you. Um, so that's, that's something that we can do. Um, if it's a super hard to get gun or item, chances are we're not going to uh, be as flexible. Um, but I've had people take a gun that's hard to get and be like, yeah, put this in the back for me for a week and I'll be back, back next week, like no money down and whatever. And it's like, I could have sold this gun 20 times over that week and then they never come back. So we are a little particular about our layaway program. So yes, no problem. Um, have you heard anything about when and if the Canic TTI combat might become available here? I would get one if I could. Um, I actually saw that at shot and I'll, I'll do that transfer all day long. It's, it's not a problem for me. Um, but I got to, uh, I got to open up the lines of communication with them. Haven't had that chance. So, um, unfortunately the Springfield echelon is a little outside the, you know, I don't think so. I, I probably wouldn't do that. Um, so, and thank you, TJ, for uh, writing letters to PSA. Um, I think everybody should do that. Write some letters to them. Write some letters to Bravo Company and say, cut it out. Knock it off. What the heck's wrong with you? And uh, let's get some machine guns around here. That's right. You know, unlike other states, Massachusetts, you can actually own a machine gun. Um, what's really funny is I was up at a real estate closing uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, um, and <laughs> they needed two forms of ID. So obviously my driver's license. And guess what the other license I gave them was? It wasn't even the LTC. It wasn't one of the three gun dealer licenses. I gave him my license to own and possess machine guns. It caused an interesting eyebrow raise in the uh, in the uh, the law office there, but I had to do it. I just had to do it. They're like, "Wow, what's that?" <laughs> so yeah, fun times. Um, I actually got through a airport security line with my machine gun license once too. I've told this story before, but uh, it's worth repeating because I got all the way through security and realized I didn't have uh, to the TSA security line, realized I didn't have my driver's license. So I'm like, shoot, I go, I, I opened up my wallet and fanned them out like a deck of cards. I'm like, pick a card, any card. Uh, I got like six other forms of government issued ID. Nope, it's got to be a driver's license or a passport. I'm like, dude, come on, really? I go, how about this? License to carry, license to sell guns, license to sell ammo, license to perform gunsmithing. I have a machine gun license. And the guy's looking at it. Finally, a TSA agent comes over and whispers in the guy, let him through. He's like, what, are we going to take this? As a... He said, just shut up and let him through. And they didn't realize that one of the guys who worked for me was behind me in line. And uh, so... He goes, all right, you heard the man, go ahead through and go throw your bags on the thing and fill the bucket and laptops and shoes off and blah, blah, blah. And so I'm sitting there taking my belt off and my shoes and putting them in the tray. And my employee comes up cracking up laughing. And I'm like, what's so funny? And he goes, after you walked away, the, the boss says to the TSA guy, that's a federal agent. And he goes, what? How do you know? He goes, because they only give out machine gun licenses to federal agents. So my uh, my guy heard that and he was cracking up laughing. Like, So that was the funny part of the story was uh, I was nicknamed federal agent for the rest of that trip. But anyway, um, yeah, silly. I know, silly. Um, by the way, I did put the number on the screen if you want to call in. 508-444-2120 is the number. I haven't been good about kicking that number around at all. Um, and so I apologize for that, but we're going to take a quick break and I'm going to show you this week's gun of the week. So here we go. Get Another ready. rapid fire gun of the week. This week's gun of the week is a gun that I am really happy to show you, 
but I'm not happy to tell you that you can't buy it in certain states. Massachusetts is a state that has banned the sale of the most popular, common, and ordinary guns in America, obviously unconstitutionally. Plus, there's seven other states that would prohibit the possession of this gun because it has what's known as a sound suppressor or silencer attached to it. This is also known as a two-stamp gun. So other states regulate NFA items and ban them all together, so you can't even own a, an NFA item like a short-barreled rifle. So this gun is the Honey Badger made by Q up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and it is a two-stamp gun. So it has the suppressor, which would require separate paperwork and a $200 tax be paid to the federal government for the privilege of owning a sound suppressor or silencer. And it has an eight and a half inch barrel. So it is known as a short barreled rifle, which would require another $200 tax stamp to be paid to the federal government for a gun that is in common and ordinary use. So $400 in taxes be paid. Anyone, can anyone think of a Boston Tea Party event that happened to protest unlawful taxes? Well, I think this is one, but anyway, I digress. This gun is a phenomenal gun. It is based on the AR-15. The Honey Badger is that personal defense weapon configuration. So you'll see it has a retractable stock that deploys and uh, it's a short overall uh, package. This one happens to be in 300 blackout, so the silencer is very efficient and makes it very quiet, especially if you use subsonic ammunition. This is what I would consider a hearing safe gun. Certainly not Hollywood quiet, but it's outside. If you're shooting with subsonics, it's definitely hearing safe. It reduces the decibels by about 29, 30 dB. This gun is a very high quality gun uh, made out of billet. It's got like a matched upper and lower. It's got a Geisley trigger in it. They've put a QD sling swivel in both sides of the uh, buttstock attachment there. It's ambi safety on it. Uh, it's got some Magpul furniture that kind of rounds it out. Other than that, it's an AR-15. It's a very high quality AR-15, but the fact that some states need not apply and you can't buy this in some states is a violation of your constitutional rights. The Heller decision back in 2008 said that no gun that is in common and ordinary use can be banned by the federal government. And yet here we are. So it's high time that the courts take an assault weapon ban case all the way up to the Supreme Court, I would say, is the only way to make this right for everybody in the country. Because right now we have two different classes of citizens, depending on what state you live in. Some states you're perfectly legally able to purchase this gun. Other states you're not. So that is a problem. And I would like to see that problem fixed. So let's all hope that the four cases that are seeking cert before the Supreme Court, one of them will be granted, hopefully the Maryland one, the Bianchi case that is out of the Fifth Circuit in Maryland will make it because that was a final judgment case, which makes sense that that case would be heard. So I hope that they'll take it and uh, we'll, we'll have some uniform laws throughout the country and that you won't be penalized by what state you live in because your local and state governments want to take away your right to keep and bear arms from a gun that is in common and ordinary use. And it, is useful for offensive or defensive purposes. That is also one of the other criteria. So there you have it, folks. The gun of the week is one that you can't buy no matter how many discount codes you put in. This won't be for sale, unfortunately, because frankly, it's not legal for sale in this state. But there it is, the Q Honey Badger. It's a phenomenal gun. If you live in a free state and you want to check one of these out, there's lots of companies that sell them. They're awesome guns. I've shot quite a few rounds through this gun and I, I love shooting it. It's a lot of fun, uh, great gun. And uh, we should be able to own this and possess this gun in whatever state you live in and be able to buy and sell and trade just like you always could for the first 200 years in this country. So let me know what you think, sound off in the comments. Please like and subscribe and share this video to anyone who you think would appreciate it. I'm Toby Leary, we'll see you around the shop and on Rapid Fire, thanks for tuning in. All right. Well, there you have that. The gun of the week that you can't buy. Sorry. Welcome to Maskanistan.
And uh, yeah, they don't like two stampers in this state. <laughs> and uh, they don't like uh, they don't like freedom, the sound of freedom. Yeah. Um, they don't like a lot of guns in this state. And uh, they're certainly never going to willfully allow you to buy that gun. I think um, what we're, what we're going to see is an assault weapons ban case make it to SCOTUS. That'll open the doors for us to be able to buy whatever gun is in common and ordinary use and lawful for purchase. So hopefully someday uh, that comes to fruition. I hate the fact that that's what we have to hope for and rely on, but those of us in the hateful eight, the eight states that remain that do not allow suppressor ownership, um, you know, that's that's where we are. Uh, let's see. Um, good to see you, Anne Murray, and uh, thank you, New York Outcast. And uh, Patrick, the, that sounds like a nice rig, the DD m4 v9 upper with an eotech and a on a pre-band colt should serve you well and uh the furthest i've ever hit a golf ball is i don't want to i don't want to say it because no one will believe it um but <laughs> i've literally almost come to the 350 mark 350 yard mark uh, but i had gravity and topography working in my favor so i got it over the crest of this hill and it rolled probably 30 yards so um yeah i was a long ball hitter in my day but those days are over um let's see uh been super busy house renovation yuck okay um want to bring your attention to a story that at first glance i was kind of like I don't know about this and it's it's a it's an interesting story let's put it that way Michigan man charged with felony assault after drawing a gun in self defense um Isaiah Ware was just trying to buy some lasagna for dinner when he strolled into a gun store in Bloomfield Hills Michigan last October what should have been a quick trip instead ended up with Ware facing felony assault charges after a confrontation with another shopper. Ware was headed toward the self-checkout when he bumped into a customer, Calvin Williams. Surveillance footage from the store shows the two men exchanging words, and then Ware pulls his gun from his holster. Based on both witness statements and surveillance footage, it doesn't appear that Ware ever pointed the gun. Instead, the two men separated, with Ware continuing on to the self-checkout with his pistol at his side. He didn't make any threatening motions with that weapon, said Neil Brand, Ware's defense attorney. Ware can be seen in the video walking away from Williams, his gun in his right hand and a bottle of Windex and groceries in the other. Ware watched Williams as they parted. That ended the threat, and that ended the problem, Brand claims. Williams could be heard on police body camera footage providing his perspective of the situation. He didn't point, but he pulled it where... Uh, were other customers and around people, Williams said. Broomfield Township Police arrested Ware and the prosecutor's office charged him with assault with a deadly weapon. So at this point in the story, I'm thinking, well, it does seem a little extreme to just pull out a gun over an argument in the middle of a gun store, in the middle of a grocery store. So uh, that makes me a little wary. I'm kind of like tensing up over the thought of that. Goes on to say, you don't have to be alone in the woods with a violent stranger before you can lawfully defend yourself with a firearm. We have the right to carry for self-defense in public, which inevitably means that we have the right to defend ourselves when there were others around. And the vast majority of defensive gun uses don't result in a trigger being pulled at all. The presence of the firearm is enough to end the threat. Did Ware have reasonable belief that Williams threatened him with great bodily harm? Based on Williams' own statements to police, I'd say yes. Brand released more body camera video where Williams told police that he would have slammed Ware to the ground. So when the cops were talking with this guy Williams, 
he says he would have slammed Ware to the ground. He says, to be honest, if he wouldn't have had the gun on him, I would have slammed him to the ground right there. So that brings into focus why Ware would have brought the gun out in the first place. If the guy was threatening to slam him to the ground for bumping into him, then maybe he was justified. In other words, the presence of the lawfully possessed pistol in Ware's hands did stop him from being physically assaulted under Michigan law. The use of deadly force is justified when an individual honestly and reasonably believes that the use of deadly force is necessary to pre prevent the imminent death or imminent great bodily harm to himself or herself or to another individual. Does being slammed to the ground count as great bodily harm? Again, I'd say yes. Granted, we're only hearing Ware's side of the story here, but it does sound like he has a strong defense. Not only that, but we hear the body cam uh, admission by Williams. The victim admits that Ware never pointed a gun at him, told police the presence of the gun stopped him from physically attacking Ware, and Ware himself sought to de-escalate the encounter by walking away from Williams instead of escalating the confrontation once he had his gun in hand. That's not the kind of case I'd want to bring before a jury if I was a prosecutor, but for now, the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office isn't backing down. In a brief statement to WDIV-TV, the prosecutor said that online, the office can't comment on the specific circumstances, but we take such cases very seriously and we will continue to pursue all appropriate charges. Well, that is, well that's the problem, isn't it? A felony assault charge doesn't seem appropriate given what we know about the incident, where Ware's trial is set for June 17th. So there's still time for the Oakland County prosecutor to drop the case. But at this point, it looks like a jury of Isaiah Ware's peers will soon decide whether he should remain a free man or be remanded to the custody of the state for pulling his pistol and saving himself from being body slammed to the floor. Uh, article by Cam Edwards on Bearing Arms. You can check that story out if you want. So it, you know, brings up an interesting question, especially for those of us who call Massachusetts home. I have had frequent discussions with Jason Guida, who used to work for the state in the prosecutor's office and also in the attorney general's office um, under the public uh the Department of Public Safety's purview. And he did tell me that, you know, the, the state is recommended guidelines are that any interaction with a firearm will lead you to being arrested and having to explain yourself in court. Uh, we had Rob Pincus here last weekend for a interesting weekend of um, classes we and this topic came up and he said like in texas they feel like if you corner cross someone's yard you can shoot them dead because it's texas and in massachusetts we feel that if you ever needed to use a gun uh defensively even if shots aren't fired you're going to jail and gonna have to defend yourself and i would say He's probably right that there's no universal truth to both. Uh, but the the fact remains that if it's the attorney general's guidelines or it's, you know, common knowledge in law enforcement agencies that gun issues get resolved in the courts and not at the discretion of the officers, this article really uh, begs the question of where does that leave us, right? Um, do you brandish a firearm before things get physical if somebody's threatening to body slam you in the supermarket for bumping into them? You know, I still say, yeah, you probably have to, or at least you got to separate space. And if the guy starts walking towards you, maybe that's the time to do it. I don't know that I would do it if you're toe to toe with someone. I don't want to be within two arms reach and introduce a gun I don't know what this guy's thinking. I don't know, you know, if I don't have to shoot, I don't want to shoot. Thankfully, that was the outcome in this case. But the fact remains, um, 
it might have been a better idea to separate himself and walk away first. And, you know, if the guy follows, then deploy the firearm. Say, guys, like, hey, man, this is over. Like, go back to your space. I just want to check out, go home to my family. I'm sure you want to go home to your family. This is over. Let's let's play it cool, all right? But, um, you know, the sad thing is, even with Williams' admission to the cop, and even with all security footage being pulled, and even like Ware's side of the story kind of checking out, they still arrest him and charge him with assault and battery with a deadly weapon or felony assault with a deadly weapon. Um, so what do you think? Do you think the guy could have played it a little better? Do you think there's no circumstance where this guy should have brought his gun out unless he was in immediate fear for his life, which I would say he could have been in fear for his life, especially not knowing the size of where and the size of Williams. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things without knowing all the facts and all the details, but even if they were pretty equally sized, I don't want to go hands on with anybody. Like I feel pretty confident I can kind of handle myself, but I don't want to, like, I don't want to risk getting punched in the face. I don't want to risk getting kneed in the groin. I don't want to risk having my arm ripped off with some street fighter who knows jujitsu, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And, uh, yeah, New York outcast says, seems like brandishing at best to me. Um, Let's see, uh, that would be brandishing in California, which is also a felony. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, Alicia, the broomstick babe, I don't know her. Um, maybe you can send me her at and I'll look her up and maybe we can get her on. Uh, yeah, thank you, Joel. Um, maybe the next gun of the week can be a Colt single action a cowboy gun that never seems to make the roster. Or how about? Well, they probably never will because I don't think they're in production anymore. So no manufacturer is going to pay to have that gun added to the roster. It's. I just want to see the whole roster go away. Like the roster needs to go away. I think that has a better likelihood of that than the single action army. Um, there are single action armies that are legal and lawful for sale in Massachusetts. I've sold a bunch as long as they're in the state prior to 98. And um, that's easy enough. Well, not easy enough, but they are around. Or get like the Ruger Vaquero, which is a good alternative. Um, I know it's not the Colt, but that's still a, a phenomenal gun. And I love the Ruger Vaquero, so I'm going to get one someday. I always say I'm going to do that, uh, but I haven't done it yet. Um, good drive, White Wolf. Um, and Joel is lamenting the fact that the most popular handgun in America, the Glock 19, which is on the roster, but for some reason I legally can't buy one. That's true. Um, and unless you're law enforcement, we have that two-tiered justice system, right? We have two tiers of rights in this state where police get some special privileges that you don't get. And the reason for that is the attorney general's office has declared that the Glock is unsafe and you should not own one. This goes all the way back to 98, Tom O'Reilly. And he said that these are unsafe guns after Glock sent them for testing. They passed. They tried to play ball with Massachusetts. They um, sent them to gun stores and we, we were selling them. And then all of a sudden he said, oh, no, you don't. Uh, this is the most popular gun in America. 
and you can't buy it because we need to be able to slow and stem the tide of gun sales in Massachusetts. So this was effectively a backdoor gun ban without proper legislation through the attorney general's office by the Consumer Protection Act and basically saying um, that this gun is unsafe because it didn't have a loaded chamber indicator. And so Glock stepped up and bought every gun that was sold in Massachusetts that people rose their hand and said, okay, I got this gun. Most people were like, I don't care. I'm keeping it. But gun stores had to make the effort to you know, reach out to the customer and tell them they had to buy the gun back. And Glock bought them back at full retail. Whereas they were losing twice because that gun has gone to a distributor and then to a dealer, which mark both market up. So it was a, at tremendous cost to Glock. So Glock is once bitten, twice shy. So uh, the attorney general's office said, well, we got a little bit of a problem here because cops want the Glock. And that's what like 65% of all police departments use. So we got to give police an exemption here. So by giving the police an exemption, they admit that the gun's not unsafe, which is why they banned it in the first place. And if they are, if they weren't admit, you know, making that admission, they want cops to be armed with unsafe guns, but they know it's BS. And so they're, they're not gonna, uh, ban the guns for the police, just the people, because they want to make sure it's hard for us to acquire and possess and own firearms how everything is in this state. So that's the story behind that. Now, ironically, the Gen 5 Glocks actually call the extractor a loaded chamber indicator. And it's the same design as the VP9 uses on their guns. And even some of the Rugers use it as well. But alas, they're still once bitten, twice shy. They should just resubmit well they don't need to resubmit the guns they've all already been tested but they should just resubmit an affidavit to the state and say all gen 5 glocks now have a loaded chamber indicator and therefore are lawful and legal for sale in massachusetts the problem is that the manufacturer has to do this like i'm like i'll do it you know uh, let me sign an affidavit that says the glock has a loaded chamber chamber indicator now and they're like, nope, you can't. Glock has to do it. So I've called Glock several times. Like, you guys do realize now that your gun has an LCI on it, all you have to do is file an affidavit to the state and say, say that our guns now comply with the law and your attorney general's regulations, the Commonwealth of Mass regulations, CMR, whatever it is. And now we're going to, allow them to be sold to gun shops. Wait 30 days. If you don't hear from the attorney general's office, sell the crap out of them. But I think, again, they're they're once bitten, twice shy. But there you go. Um, how, did, how did that happen, TJ? Armed robbery at 7-Eleven, Norwell, Massachusetts, three non-English speaking people. Hmm. How would they have got a gun if they don't even know how to speak English? Hmm. things that make you go hmm uh let's see people say a lot and don't do half of it that's true brandishing the latest newcomers to the u.s must have good laugh on that one uh <laughs> who else just saying that's i heard glock club always has bad coffee and old donuts anyway <laughs> Uh, what are you trying to say there, New York outcast? I I have some Glocks. I like them. Um, but they don't do much for me. I had an EDC as a Glock 19 for a few years. And when I went to the SIG 365, a much smaller gun, I could shoot it better. When does that happen? When you go down in size on a gun and you can shoot it better. 
Um, yeah, Anne Marie, you're pointing out um, something that we see every day in the newspapers. Um, for those of you at the beginning of the show, when I was doing the Howie Carr cheap bastard deal, um, we Howie was mentioning the rise in crime in Massachusetts and especially in my area in Hyannis. And he's 100% right. It's uh, It really is on the rise. It's just, you know, um, going like crazy. Uh, so it's something to think about um, as you continue to make it harder um, for good people to buy guns. Crime usually rises. It's the way it is. Um, you know, we've seen it play out time and time and time again. And um, there's places like Plano, Texas, the gun capital of America. More people own AK-47s, AR-15s, high-capacity magazines, all kinds of assaulty type weapons in Plano, Texas. There's enough weapons for every man, woman, and child to own nine guns in Plano, Texas. That's by far the highest per capita of any other uh, town in the continental and, well, in the 50, all 50 states. And guess what? Lowest crime rate as well. One of the lowest violent crime rates in the country. So, you know, it's one of those things that's just, it's unbelievable uh, how we love to blame the gun and the presence of the gun. And it goes back to what I was trying to say in the first hour, how people who think the mere presence of a gun is going to vaporize everyone in the room and it doesn't happen. So anyway, um, mo how much cash do they think they will get? Most folks pay with a card or an app. You're right about that, Anne-Marie. Uh, I'm sure armed robbery is not what it used to be. Uh, you get a lot of credit card receipts, get a lot of, uh, you know, Venmo, <laughs> Venmo digits. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, that is what I got for you guys uh, for today on Rapid Fire. We, uh, it, including the Howie Car Cheap Bastard deal, we're up around two hour mark. Uh, and I've been talking a lot this week. I did four hours on the Howie Car Show yesterday, four hours on Monday, and uh, two hours today. So I might need to go get a hot tea with some lemon and honey. Uh, because I'm not quite as, uh, I'm no Paul Harvey, let's let's say that. Uh, but, you know, you guys are the best, and I, I love you all, and thanks so much for joining week in and week out. And uh, we're going to get to some of the nitty-gritty of the news, uh, the, some of the deeper dives into some of these court cases that have come up. And uh, we're also going to keep track of everything going on here in Massachusetts with the conference committee. We're going to see um, hopefully uh, a, uh, well, hopefully or hopefully not see something come out of that anytime soon. Um, it'd be great to see that just go by the wayside, them spin their wheels until it goes nowhere. However, I'm afraid both sides are very committed to seeing something happen. So I'm not going to get my hopes up that the clock runs out um and uh we're just gonna have to see what we're up against and hopefully once the final version of the bill comes out we can put enough pressure on them to before their up or down vote and say you know we're we're counting on this and the undocumented illegal aliens coming to the state and bankrupting our state because of our stupid right to housing laws uh will cause a massive turnover in the state legislature this this fall. Already 14 or 16 Democrats aren't running again for re-election, so that's good. But the time is running out on who we can primary against them. I think you have to file papers very, very soon, so hopefully some good people will run. All right, that's the best show I got for you on 
April 17th, 2024. Don't forget, in two days, we got Patriots Day, and that's going to be awesome. So maybe next year we'll start doing like free gun rentals on Patriots Day or something like that. Uh, but we should definitely all be shooting in uh, harmony with the shot heard around the world, right? All right. God bless you all. Take care. I'll